Welcome back to the podcast, everybody. It is with tremendous joy that I present uh, today's episode, an interview with two women who I think are absolute legends. But before I get to the conversation with them, I want you to listen to part of a speech that Madonna made on stage at Madison Square Garden on Tuesday, January 23rd, earlier this year. I don't think that there is any better introduction for these two women who I'm speaking to today than Madonna's words. So take a moment to listen to those, and then we'll jump right into it. But I want you all to remember, if you can, how shocking and horrifying it was in the early 80s when when AIDS swept through our city and took this place like a brush fire and just laid everybody out and destroyed so many beautiful, creative, amazing, incredible people. Now on this subject, there are two very important people here in the audience tonight that I would like to thank. They're nurses. Their names are Helen Metzer and Valerie Hughes. They are heroes. Now, they, they have a book out right now called Nurses on the Inside. That's not why I'm here to promote their book. I'm here to give thanks to them for being at the front line of the AIDS crisis so many years ago. Thank you. Thank you for your bravery and your courage. I don't know where you are, but I know you're here tonight, and it means so much to me. You guys, I don't know if you remember, but there was a time when it was not cool to be gay, and it was really not cool to have AIDS. It's never cool, but I remember people holding up posters saying, faggots should die of AIDS. Do you remember that? A pretty horrifying experience. A pretty horrifying, scary time. I remember going to St. Vincent's Hospital and visiting the AIDS ward. There were no visitors. There were two nurses and no visitors. Nobody wanted to associate with these people. People were afraid. They didn't know if they were going to get the disease. They didn't know what was happening. They were scared. Nobody wanted to touch these people. And these amazing women, angels, heroes, heroes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for starting a wave for setting up AIDS wards in so many hospitals. St. Roosevelt, St. Vincent's, uh, Lenox Hill. I can't remember all the hospitals, but I remember visiting one of them. And I remember one young man, he was in, he was in another place. He wasn't really conscious anymore, but he was near death. And I laid down on the bed next to him and he, held my hand and he said, Mother, thank you for coming. And it just made me think, these women here tonight, they did this every fucking day. And they got no... They got no praise. They got no thanks. So please say thank you to them right now. Thank you, Helen and Helen. Welcome to all of our listeners, all of our viewers. Today I am very, very, very happy to welcome our two guests today, 
Um, Ellen Matzer and Valerie Hughes, they are the authors of Nurses on the Inside, which is essentially the stories of the HIV AIDS epidemic in New York City. Um, they are also the authors of Beyond the Mask, a fictional psychological chronicle of six healthcare workers trying to navigate the callous healthcare system at the onset of the COVID crisis in New York City. Welcome, Valerie. Welcome, Ellen. It is an honor and a pleasure. It really is. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, listen, the first thing I wanted to say is I really <clears throat> appreciate when I looked, when I, first of all, when I found out about, about you two, um, I found out obviously through the, the, the speech that Madonna gave at Madison Square Garden. Um, and when I started to do my research on you both and I saw Nurses on the Inside and then I saw um, Beyond the Mask, I really appreciated the, the, the link, the correlation between the two, because at the beginning of the COVID crisis, so in the 90s, um, I was in a relationship and my partner went in the relationship with that di was diagnosed as HIV positive. And so I went through the, um, you know, giving him a bath at one in the morning to lower his temperature, like I went through the whole process of getting him onto clinical or, or accompanying him as he got onto clinical trials and and so forth. And this was like the mid to late 90s. So there had been more advancements than at the onset of of this. But um, I really, at the beginning of COVID, I just thought this seems very, very familiar. Yeah. And I remember wanting to post something on social media saying something like, there is a part of me psychologically that is getting a very sick glee from the fact that now everybody knows what we went through back then. <laughs> you know, and I didn't, I didn't post it, but I wanted to, um, because I was making links. I was seeing similarities that were just so obvious that, that people who weren't part of that community, who thought that that had nothing to do with them probably didn't even think of. So I really appreciate the fact that between your two books, there is that correlation. I think it's, it's mm -hmm. really important. Um, on page 19 of the book, it's written that Ellen's father had said to you, you know, when you were talking about the trials and tribulations of nursing school, he had said to you, quote, you'll make it through. If everything was easy, you wouldn't appreciate it when you're done. Mm -hmm. About 10 pages later, page 29, and this is modern, this is like 2019. Ellen, you said to Valerie, quote, all those challenges are what made us helped us get ready for the epidemic. Maybe it's exactly why we were so drawn to it. And Valerie, you responded to Ellen by saying, it was the best way to make a difference, to care for someone, to be needed. In these three statements, there is the concept of purpose, that you're not just doing something to do something, you're doing something because there's some sort of greater good that's going to come out of it. Can you talk to me? Can you talk to the listeners, um, the viewers, about when you look back, do you see that there was some sort of, I don't know, thread of spirituality, thread of purpose that sort of was arming you for something, even if you couldn't have known what it was arming you for? I don't know I if I could speak to the spirituality of it, but I know that I always had to have, uh, I knew, know that my work had to have purpose. That was very important to me. I thought it was just nursing. And I thought, nursing would be the answer, but really there was, it was deeper than that. So um, I guess I was, I was looking for a specialty or a calling, if you were, if you will. Um, so yeah, there definitely was part of that in me that I was searching for that. Mm -hmm. I, I think, I, I mean, I'm certainly going to agree with that. I mean, you know, originally uh, my calling was, critical care, which is where Val and I met. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew there was something more than being on a regular telemetry slash med, they call it a med surge unit, where the patients aren't that sick. So, you know, you could go hours without seeing a patient. But then I, I was, I had a calling to be a critical care nurse where, you know, moment to moment, life and death mattered. But then Again, when, when Val and I always thought back about, you know, we started to see the first cases of what we now know was AIDS back in 1980, um, we both had left Roosevelt Hospital and I went into an ICU in Queens, which I wrote about. And there, the 
stigmatization and the homophobia was so rampant um, that I knew then I had a greater purpose. And I knew the phobia and the stigmatization had to do with gay men because that's all I saw at that time. And I was reprimanded for spending too much time in a room, again, which is like I wrote about in the book. And that's when I saw the New York Times ad for please come join us. You know, human health is never more critical than at this time. St. Clair's, uh, the opening of the new first designated aid center. And I saw that it was a full page Times article, whereas that's where we look for jobs because there was no internet back then. And I said, that's where I need to be. And the next day I was interviewed for the opening of the unit. It was late 1985 and I was hired on the spot and uh, I gave notice. In fact, I gave up vacation time accrued because I didn't stay long enough. So I gave up like if I had stayed like two more weeks or something, I could have gotten two weeks vacation pay. And I said, it's not worth it. I have to get out of here. And I, I gave virtually no notice. And literally a week later, I was, I mean, the onboard, there was no onboarding. You just started work. It started, you know? yeah. It just started. So there I was uh, in St. Clair's Spelman Center. <laughs> and I knew right away that was where, where I needed to be immediately. And so if you, if you know that and you have that certainty, at, I mean, I, I, maybe this is a rhetorical question, but at any point in this, when this was growing, you know, when the HIV AIDS epidemic was becoming the epidemic and no one knew what was going on and government seemed to just turn a blind eye to it and the suffering was real. At any point, did you just think, I can't do this? Was there ever any, a moment where you just thought, OK, it's it's too much? Never. No. Really? No. Never. I just I needed to do it more. I mean, yeah, I just, bring it on. Huh? Yeah, really? yeah, I, yeah, mm-hmm. bring, bring it on. Open more. Yeah. I mean, we opened at in the in the Spelman Center. We rapidly opened units. We started with two units. It was the third floor and the fourth floor. And then all of a sudden we took over the second floor and then we developed a unit for inmates with AIDS. And then we branched out and added the clinic. And um, and then we took over another piece of the fourth floor and third floor and second floor. So I believe by the time I left there, there were six geographical units plus the clinic. Um, and, it, you know, it was just the the need was so great. I mean, patients were just they were lined up in the ER. There was no there was just no room for them. No. So they kept just taking over more units. And and this this actually saved St. Clair's from from going bankrupt um, because back then there was no DRG code for billing for AIDS. So, so they, you know, to them, it was, let's keep the hospital open and make money. But, you know, I, I, I can speak for myself and sure Val, I mean, you know, money never entered the picture, you know, let's make more money. No, no, let's just get more patients in. Let's take care of these people, you know, that nobody wants. So, I mean, all right. So we stretch it out another unit, go down and, you know, the units were, were like re- rectangulars and they were called different things. So we just moved into the next part of the rectangle and then, and then circled around. So, but, but of course it meant trying to get nurses that, that would want to work there. And a lot of times we couldn't. So we didn't have that many nurses, but we had a lot of uh, nursing aides and orderlies well, they were all called CNAs now, but they were orderlies if they were male and they were nurse aides. But um, people walked in the door and said, I want to help. And they and we said, oh, can you be an orderly? Yeah, OK. <laughs> Boom, you're, get, you're getting trained. Can I be a can I be a secretary? Yes. OK. And sit down and answer the phones. It was it was like that. I mean, it's on and the spot if, disaster crisis management. Yep. It, That's it, what exactly. it was. It did. It really did seem like a war zone at the time. Mm hmm. Wow. Um, I was speaking to my uncle a few weeks ago and, and we were talking about something that had, has nothing to do with this, but he said to me, you know, we love to have a witness to our life. You know, we were talking about the concept of being in relationship to someone else. And he, and, and I was just sort of philosophizing about why is it, why do we seek that partnership? Why do we seek that accompaniment? And he just said, look, we'd love to have a witness to our life. 
And that really resonated with me. And, you know, it was a few days after that, that I got your book and I read it. And I thought, you know, that you two have provided that role for people whose families abdicated that role, you know, the people whose families just like disappeared, um, whose friends and, 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 and loved ones disappeared. You've provided that role for each other, that witness mm -hmm. to the experience. And I was wondering if you can speak to that, that, that role of accompaniment. I mean, what's it like, especially for you two, you've known each other for so long and it's not like you've known each other for a weekly card game. <laughs> you know, it's like you have, you have gone through it. Um, what is it like? Well, first of all, what was it like to accompany these people who were coming in and you knew, and they, I guess at some point knew that they were going to die. What was that like to accompany someone that way? And then what is it like to accompany each other for such a longer period of time in such a fundamental way? So I would say that to accompany the patient, um, <clears throat> I don't think they always knew they were going to die. I think people have hope until the end. Um, I also think that people die when they're ready to die. It can't happen on a timetable. Um, people always surprised me. W when I think about the early years at, at Lenox Hill, I think about one young man who went to work with a fever of 104 every day because I think he knew that if he admitted he was sick, then that was the beginning of the end. And he showed up at some testing clinic that Ellen was doing, and Ellen said, you need to be admitted. <laughs> I mean, I think his temperature was 104.5, and she said, you need to be admitted. And, um, I, you know, he got admitted to not to 80s to got admitted to another floor which meant that he was my patient then uh because i took care of the patients who were off off the main floor and talking to him i was uh so shocked that he was in denial about having hiv and really full-blown aids by the time i saw him he had pcp at the time which is why he was having such a bad fever and um but when i got him undressed i mean ellen's gone through this as well. We've both gone through this. Got him undressed and chaos lesions everywhere. He was all bundled up, even though I think it was May or June, and he was wearing three undershirts, a turtleneck, a suit jacket, an overcoat. And as I was peeling the layers off, I was finding more and more chaos lesions. So he he knew he was sick, but I think if he said to himself, if I admit it, then I'm doomed. And um, he actually did make it through that hospitalization, which I didn't think he would, but he did. And um, and I think it's possible that he lived another year, but uh, but he had no T cells to speak of, so it was inevitable that he was going to get an illness that would that would be his last illness. Uh, so walking through him with that was you can't just say to people, you know, you're deathly ill, you're going to die, you better make arrangements, you better tell everybody you ever met, because they're going to be planning the funeral soon. People are not ready to hear that. You have to meet people where they are. And this man was not in that place at all. And I very rarely met somebody who was in that place who really knew that was going to be their last moment. And when I did, I was always so astounded by it. When people realized it was the end, most people do not. And so uh, what I say about meeting people where they are, there are two main things I always try to teach people about nursing is that you bring yourself to the job. It's not just your skills. It's who you are. And you meet the patient where they are. You meet the sick person where they are, because to try to hope that they're going to uh, know more about it than they do and that they're going to come to a conclusion that might take years for anybody to accept to to ex expect that to happen is silly so you have to you know walk the road with them so that they understand first of all they're not alone and second of all you might be able to sort of intimate what might be coming but you can't tell people they're terribly sick and are going to die you just can't do that you know people always say oh give it to me straight no that's <laughs> you will find out when you if you ever work with sick people that you, that you need to lead them gently into the idea i love that and i love the the what you just said walk the road with them 
Mm-hmm. That's what you do. We walk the road with them because mm-hmm. otherwise, if they're there alone, mm-hmm. that's a horrible, horrible journey. But I've walked the road. Ellen has walked the road many times with many people. And you've mm-hmm. walked the road with each other. And I mean, yes, Valerie, that too. Valerie, what's, that, what's that like for you to to have this person? For lack well, of a uh, term, not we, to dehumanize you at all, Ellen, but to have <laughs> this person with whom you've 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 shared, you have such a shared history. Right. And so we have the shared history. And so many things don't even need to be said. We just have to look at each other and then the communication happens. So yeah, there's a a, a lot of shortcuts that happen now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and during the time when we work together. Can I tell the story about the fake nurse? Please. Uh, Please. <laughs> yes, you may. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen was so overwhelmed with everything because she had all the med surge beds and I just had the ICU and the ER. So uh, by that time, we were sort of administrators, really. And um, so she said to me, I don't know, I've got to do some background on this woman. She's so bad. I said, well, where did she go to school? And she said, well, she says she went to X school. And I said, that's a pretty good school. I can't understand why she wouldn't know these things. You say she doesn't know. And she, Ellen said, you go down there and watch her past meds and you tell me what you think. So I went down there and uh, to the floor where she was working and she was trying to mix up an antibiotic, which nurses don't need to do anymore, but we had to do in those days. And that involves withdrawing a certain amount of fluid from a sterile bottle with a syringe and a needle and using sterile technique. And you have to insert it into a bottle of antibiotics and then you have to shake it up and then pull out the liquefied antibiotic and put it in a bigger bag to give it to a a patient. Or in the case of an injection, you know, like an IM injection, just give it to the patient then. So there she is um, with the need in the first step with her the needle in the bottle. And one of the things about pulling fluid out of the uh, out of a sterile vacuum sealed bottle is that you have to have the bevel of the needle or the opening of the needle under it actually inside the water inside the liquid. Because you can pull and pull and pull, but if the bevel isn't down there, you're never going to withdraw any fluid. And there she was. She had the bevel of the needle in the airspace of the bottle, and there was no way she was ever going to get any liquid in there. And I said, okay, we're done here. (laughs) (laughs) I went to Ellen. I said, this woman's not a nurse. Let's find out what's going on. And it turns out she had stolen somebody's license and she wasn't a nurse. She'd never been to nursing school a day in her life. And I said, out, we're getting out now. (laughs) That is unbelievable. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. She had the license and the registration. She had all the paperwork, but there was nothing up here that she had to do anything nothing. about nursing at all. I mean, she was a nice person, but. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> unfortunately, not the qualification that was needed. <laughs> well, not for that job. Exactly. You know, we not only had to, uh, you know. Be she might have been a volunteer, a good volunteer. But she would have been a great certainly, volunteer. Certainly but... not giving meds. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Good intentions. <laughs> good intentions. Oh, my God. <laughs> That was the worst thing. It's, I just took, I, it was like getting hit in the head with a shovel. Oh, this one's not a nurse. <laughs> Unbelievable. Wow. Mm-hmm. And and Ellen, what about you? I mean, you know, to to have accompanied, to have, you know, walked the road with them, with Valerie, What what's that experience? I mean, when you look back on it, what is that experience for you? Well, uh, I, I'm, I'm, very much in sync with Valerie about meeting the patient where they are. Um, most, there were a handful of people who said, who, who would come in to St. Clair's especially and say, I'm dying. I can't breathe. I'm dying. Like I, I, you know, and, and then break into prayer. When I, when I admitted the three inmates uh, initially, one of them was actually, was dying and he knew he was dying. He could not breathe. And I, sat there and breathed with him and breathed with him and, and got him on hundred percent oxygen and got him started on the medication to treat pneumocystis PCP. But, but he knew, and, and I sat with him and he was a, a Spanish speaking gentleman and he was praying in Spanish. And all I could do is sit there and say, just, just breathe, just take a deep breath, let the medicine work for you. Like I could tell he wasn't prepared, but he knew it. He says, I'm, I would, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. This was one of the inmates that Mother Teresa pulled from um, 
Asanin prison. And it, in a, a day, I was off the following day and the following day he had in fact had died, even though we gave him whatever we could give him to treat the pneumocystis, it was, it was too late. Um, but but what, when, when Valerie talks about walking people through the illness, I mean, we, we gave hope. I mean, we said, okay, well, you have pneumocystis and, and the drug that we use to treat that is called Bactrim and you're going to receive an infusion of it every six hours for two weeks. And that should clear up the pneumonia. And then you're going to be on Bactrim as a pill. Um, and, you know, we would, we would give them hope in so far as, okay, well, we can treat this obstacle until we encounter the next obstacle. And it's not like I would say, or we could even say, well, you're going to end up with CMV retinitis and mycobacterium mm -hmm. and, and cryptococcal meningitis because you never knew what was coming. You never knew what, they're, what they were exposed to. Everybody had something different. They went on, they usually started with pneumocystis and then all of a sudden the KS lesions appeared or all of a sudden they started seeing spots and they had CMV retinitis. All of a sudden they had blinding headaches. They had cryptococcal meningitis. They had unrelenting fevers. They had mycobacterium avium complex. They had voluminous diarrhea. They had cryptosporidiosis. I mean, we, we never could tell from one day to the other which opportunistic infection somebody was going to get. And so it just showed up one day. All of a sudden, so-and-so is having, having massive diarrhea now. So-and-so is seeing spots in their eyes. Let's get the ophthalmologist in. So-and-so is having blinding headaches. Let's, let you know, the, the infectious disease, we'll do a bone marrow and see if there's MAC. So, and each each time like this would happen, I I, I would say, you know, without, you know, remembering exactly uh, that if a patient got diagnosed with something, they said, well, what do we do now? Well, well, we have medicine. We can try to treat it. We can give you Tylenol for the fever. We'll give you cool baths. You'll drink cold liquids. We'll try to maintain your hydration. We'll give you IV fluids if you can't drink enough. You know, the patients that had wasting syndrome, that couldn't eat. We, we had a dietician that we called upon. We, we, we racked our brains figuring out how they could sneak in extra calories, you know. So, like, we never really said, okay, well, you know, now this is it, you're going to die. No, no, we're going to, we're going to put mayonnaise on your, on your, you know, on your sandwich. We're going to put salad dressing on your salad. We're going to, you know, add carnation instant breakfast. This is before all the supplements had carnation instant breakfast to your milk and in your coffee or, you know, all just little, little helpful hints to, to try to sustain somebody's nutrition status so that they could heal. Um, so, so that was, that was us. And then, and then we, you know, and then we got to the point where patients were further down the line and, and then they started to come to terms with, well, I'm not going to get any better, am I? And then that, you know, it, that was like the lead in to have, have the talk. Well, we've tried all of the medications that we have available now. And um, it, it, you may want to consider just having treatment to make you feel more comfortable and not treatment to treat whatever the disease was. All right, let's just give you some Tylenol. Let's give you some morphine. Let's give you some pain medication. Let's give you a little oxygen if you need it, but let's, and IV fluids. And if you feel like drinking Coca-Cola or ice chips, or then that's what we'll give you. And some people did opt for that and, and stop treatment. And some people said, no, 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 you know, please continue, you know, continue treating me for whatever you could treat me for in hopes that, you know, back then they could maybe get on the AZT study, which wasn't until 87, but, you know, so we had a good two plus years before we could even start that. But, you know, we, we did try everything. We did really try everything. I mean, talking about mayonnaise and salad dressing and, and incarnation instant breakfast. I mean, that was, that was our remedies. Um, well, that's all, as, those are the only tools we had at the time yeah. was feeding people and supporting them, antibiotics, steroids, all of that, but mm -hmm. no therapeutics. We didn't have any therapeutics. Mm -hmm. no, we didn't have any I mean, decent but... therapeutics until 1996. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I mean, just, I mean, just the roles that you played, listen, having been in the system in the late nineties with my then partner, I saw how valuable a kind word was, how valuable uh, just the presence, a social worker, just somebody who was saying we are, you know, 
yes, you're seeing the doctor, but I want you to come see me after. And then you're going to see this person because there was this network of support. And and, and I, I remember the fear. I remember the terror of like, what is this going to look like? And just having people who were there to accompany that process who could provide the relief that we needed because back then, well, in any, in, listen, in any medical situation, what people who are vulnerable are looking for is some form of relief from somebody who is qualified to be able to give them that relief in terms of information, in terms right. of a path forward. Mm -hmm. And I just think that, you both should be aware. I mean, I don't really know you and I didn't see your, I didn't, you know, I wasn't witness to your specific experience aside from what I read in the book, but I hope you both know what that means from somebody who had it and needed it from other people who were in the industry back then, not all the way back then, but somewhat back then. Um, are you aware? Are you aware that you were you know, you weren't just playing nurse, you were playing mother and priest and rabbi and philosopher and handholder and best friend. And are, are you aware of that? You know, I think now that we look back on it, you know, we can say yes, because it, it, we, we at, at the time, it didn't seem like it. At times, you know, we always said we are doing our job. We're nurses. We take care of people. We do what it takes to make people comfortable and to try to get them well, if possible. So it didn't seem like that at the time, you know, talking to somebody who was afraid or talking to a relative or talking, you know, and then and talking to Valerie. Like, you know, sometimes, as Valerie said, like we didn't we gave each other a look and we knew, you know, just the look knew that we were going through something terrible with a patient. But. You know, Valerie sometimes would call me to see a patient or I would call her to see a patient that I, you know, to see if, you know, in her nursing brain, she could come up with something different and or mine. But but sometimes sometimes we just broke down and cried like with each other, like we would go into the med room or, or in the in the linen closet and just burst into tears because we knew a particular person was was dying and and there was no stopping it at that point. Um, Especially so, when the patient was incredibly brave up until the end. Those always killed me. You know, there mm -hmm. one patient in particular uh, was a woman who my granny would have said she was no better than she should be. And <laughs> she'd had a hard life and she had made some bad decisions. And um, uh, she really... Um, she did make some bad decisions, but in the end, she was incredibly brave. And I'll tell you how brave she was when she got CMV retinitis, which causes blindness. Uh, she said, she said, I know about the injections and that means intraocular injections, which means putting a needle into your eyeball. Um, and she said, you go with me and I will do this. And I w went down with her and every week she would have her intraocular injections. And um, I, I couldn't believe how she did that. You know, this was a woman who couldn't face the, face the world without a heroin injection. And now she was facing, she had to live until her son got out of high school. So she was going to, she was going to endure injections into her eyeballs for however long that needed to be done. And that is bravery of the um, the highest kind. And so, you know, when I saw that, I was just totally humbled by it. I it mean, I guess that amazing. Must, you're 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 bearing witness to the 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 the, the you know the the fight, the fight. Oh, to we stay alive. we saw people fight. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. We also, and I also knew many people who said, "I can't do this fight anymore." Um, particularly people who had lost partners and they themselves were also very sick. Mm -hmm. uh, I had one patient who said, I, I just can't do this. I can't do this. And I know he went home and killed himself. I know he did because I didn't see him anymore after that. Right. So uh, there certainly was that. Um, and I'm not saying that that's not brave too. I mean, he knew what his limitations mm -hmm. were uh -huh. and, Yes, and yes. you know he had bravely lasted till he could see his partner into the ground. But, but um, you know it it was one of the things that I don't know if we could um, 
express in the book or came through in the book is how we were surrounded by death every moment. Every day there was a death. If it wasn't a patient on the outside, we were call, we were finding out from a family or a partner, or um, the police would call. I found your card in their pocket. I hated those calls. This is the New York City Police Department. We found your card in somebody's pocket. Um, that happened a lot. Um, but also, uh, how many funerals we attended in the early nineties? My God, it was unbelievable. I mean, I I would go to two or three a week. That's a lot of death. And I, when it stopped, which it did, like it came to a complete and shrieking halt in March of 1996, you know, it, that was such a relief for me. It was an unbelievable relief, but we've been sitting with this on our shoulders for so long. And, and I don't know if I expressed that well, but I'm, telling you it, uh, unrelenting having to give bad news having to share the bad news trying to give what hope there was what comfort there was that's good but sometimes you need somebody to survive and when people started to survive it felt like christmas it was fabulous i can't so, i can't imagine i do remember at some point madonna talking about those days and i know she's done so on tour and talking about how it just it just devastated like all of her friends just all of a sudden mm-hmm. one by one by one by one did you did you know i know on your instagram page you paid homage to her and debbie debbie mazer did you did you know them from no. back then had you seen them in the wards well, you know it's that's a funny story because debbie mazer is the reason that we were invited to the concert and we got the shout out from Madonna. Debbie Mazur was a volunteer back in those days at St. Vincent's and St. Clair's, although I do not remember. She reached out to me on our Instagram page and sent me, and I didn't know who Debbie Mazur was. So she says, maybe we met each other back in the 80s. I was there. And I'm going, Debbie, Debbie. Do I, did I know a nurse named Debbie? Did I know a nurse? And she's she t- she didn't give me any information. She sent me a picture of her her nail polished hand holding the book, and and then said, "You put together so many missing pieces for me." And then I said to her, she said, "Well, we must have passed." I said, "Well." What unit did you work on? Are you were you a nurse? Like did, maybe we must have worked together. And I'm thinking she's a nurse. So I this is during you know I have my phone and we're we're going back and forth on Instagram, and and suddenly I said maybe I should Google her and I Google her and I go oh fuck. <laughs> I'm like she no. sent me a picture and she said do you know this woman and I said she's an actress <laughs> and I and I said. Oh my God. Just at the same time I wrote, were you a nurse? Did I know you? Did you, what you did, did you work on? And she's typing back, no, I'm an actress. And at that moment I Googled her and I recognized her from Goodfellas. Her, and I, and I said, I said, I'm so embarrassed. I thought you were a nurse. She says, no. And she, she wasn't like, she thought I knew she should be a celebrity, knew she was a celebrity. Like I should know that. And I and I said, oh, my God, I'm so embarrassed. Here I am. I'm talking to a celebrity and I don't even know. And she says, oh, no worries. She says, I'm talking to a celebrity. She says, you have no idea how you and Valerie put the pieces, the missing pieces. She says, I always I was there. I was there in St. Clair's. I was there at St. Vincent's with Madonna. Now, Madonna may have passed us in the hallway, too. I, I don't know. You know, this was early 80s you know I didn't we were busy (laughs) oh yeah we were busy so so then it was her that said said you know my she said to me my best friend is Madonna and I was like and I'm like and you know I'm vibrating and I'm like oh okay you know like Okay, great. You know, that's, that's Madonna. Yeah, well, what's unsaid about this is that Madonna <laughs> was Ellen's idol. <laughs> yeah, well, like, I used to, to know. dress this up as Madonna and Halloween and walk around, like parade around, you know, wearing fishnets and, you know, gold boobs and d- sprayed my hair blonde and wore, you know, crosses and all kinds of belts and jewelry. You know, I did different stages of Madonna 
And I would take pictures with the patient. So Madonna was my muse. She was my muse for when I entered the fitness industry and became a good fitness instructor. I, I channeled her so that I could speak wearing a microphone. I and mean, listen, I, I have this fantasy of you being in the hospital, just doing your thing. <laughs> and this idol of yours is literally walking by behind you and you're unaware. Uh, well, <laughs> well, that could happen. Prob <laughs> probably. I mean, and, and so then Debbie Mazur said, well, you know, you she, you have to understand Madonna's platform. You know, she she was telling me all this like inside info about Madonna. You know, probably I shouldn't reveal uh, only that she said, you know, I'm going to get you. I'm going to I'm going to call Madonna's tour manager and get you tickets to the the January 23rd concert. And I'm like, what? You know, like, what, what do you mean? You know, and she says, and uh, she says, I don't want to spoil the surprise, but you're going to have a shout out for Madonna. And I'm like, I, I'm absolutely like my heart is pounding like a mile a minute. And I said, I said, this is unbelievable. I said, why would you do this? She says, because you deserve it. And I and I and Madonna's platform is she has always been an advocate for the LGBTQ and she was always around during all our fr early friends at the Danceteria. She reminded me, Danceteria died of AIDS and Keith Haring and, and Martin Borgon, her dancers all died of AIDS. And she is a huge advocate. And she, Debbie Mazur decided that I should be at the concert, Valerie should be, and Valerie should be at the concert, and Madonna should acknowledge us for all the work we did. And I said to Debbie, I said, I'm not a celebrity, we did our job. She said, but you don't, you don't understand. And I said, well, perhaps I don't, you know, like I don't understand why, you know, five years down the line, we, we put the book. So because, yes, we bore witness to a crisis of unparalleled proportions. But I didn't think, you know, or expect or want to become a celebrity from it. You know, I, like Val and I wrote the book, never thinking, oh, we're going to walk a red carpet. We're going to have a movie. We're going to, you know, we we just thought we were going to write about what we did and didn't realize that people were going to be so interested. And of course, after the Madonna shout out, uh, which my, my my daughter ended up going to the concert with me because Valerie wasn't, wasn't available, but she recorded me and all these people were shouting, thank you, thank you, thank you. And, you know, I, I was, I, I was so overwhelmed. I could, I just, I couldn't. And then, and then people like you reached out to me and, and other, other people invited us to speak about it on podcasts. And, you know, and Valerie and I were just together yesterday for my mother's birthday. And I, I, and, you know, I guess when we talk about it in retrospect, we said, well, this is really important to some people. You know, we thought we'd just write the book and the book would just sort of hang out there for a while. But it just now five years after the book, it's almost five years since that book has been published. It's it's just become so widely known. And, and people think nurses on the inside is some en entity or some business that we have. But, you know, it, it it's just us talking about us and, and our patients. Well, and, it is, but it's also you both of you talking about a moment in history that in hindsight, especially for younger generations who are growing up today, mm -hmm. it almost seems mythological. It seems unbelievable that there could have been that kind of, um, how can I put this, intentional ignoring of an issue that is very normalized today, normalized to the point where there's now PrEP, right? There's now um, the, the pre-exposure prophylaxis that, that, you know, people can take in order to not practice as safe sex as they would have been practicing or they have been practicing. That's actually something I want to ask you about. Um, but I think that it is very timely. I think that there is an education that needs to happen because I think that the generations that have grown up from let's say the late nineties onwards have no idea. And I, and they've they grown no in idea. an era where, <laughs> where <laughs> HIV AIDS is not necessarily a death sentence. And I think it's really important for that to be part of the collective education today. It's, it's partially why I'm doing this now with you. Um, and I think that the fact that this is a byproduct of you having written the book and of the work that you did over the past four decades um, is very telling and, and, and very heartwarming that it wasn't the goal. It was the byproduct, you know, that this attention 
is well-deserved and Debbie Mazar wasn't wrong. Um, that this is a story that needs to be told. And, you know, I guess you two are sort of like the, um, like the unwitting participants in it because, you know, maybe you didn't realize that, you know, 40 years from then, this was going to be something that we really did need to talk about. And listen, well, I when we to... wrote the book, we did, we did know that we, Ellen said, we have to memorialize this. No, okay, good. This can't be forgotten. And she was very right about that. Very right. Mm -hmm. Because when you think about how you felt about COVID and that that was four years ago today, that that nightmare started, mm -hmm. um, it, it, think about how much you've forgotten already. You've forgotten a lot. I've forgotten a lot. I don't have that feeling in the pit of my stomach that I used to have waking mm -hmm. up every morning. And so, um, although I did not have that same feeling back in the day when I was in my 20s and I felt invincible, uh, I, and I felt like I could solve the problem rather than, than, uh, ignore the problem, which everybody else was doing. I hate an ignored problem. Incidentally, I just hate it when people ignore our problem and Ellen does too. She's a problem solver. She sees something and she wants to fix it. I do. I do. So... Three. I'm, I'm third on that. And, <laughs> okay. and, the, and the, and the, and the problem with that is whenever I have somebody in my life who comes to me to 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 who wants a you know a shoulder to cry on or who just needs a sympathetic ear i immediately go into problem solving mode i'm like well have right you tried? which is like, not always appreciated <laughs> exactly i didn't want i didn't want advice i just needed somebody to hear me right that's an important lesson to learn too which yeah. took me many years to yeah. learn so. I'm, I'm you know still... it's in, it's interesting that's mm -hmm. you know that that's the premise why mm -hmm. i said to valerie we need to write a book about covid now like in the middle of COVID, we wrote- Yeah, before COVID. we forget. Before we forget, again. So now, I don't know if you've gotten a chance to read Beyond the Mask, but- Not yet, it's my it's my next read. But, mm -hmm. you know, we we wrote that during the pandemic. So, so we had to end it May of 2020. So we were mid pandemic. So this is the, this is the beginning and before the beginning of the pandemic, when things were starting to seem unsettled and- you know, healthcare workers were like, wait a minute, why are they locking up the masks? And why are people working from home? Like, like nothing was happening. Nobody knew anything. So I said, I had said to Valerie, you know, we, we wrote this second hand. We, we, we interviewed nurses from all over the country uh, and some from New York. And most, and the reason that it is not nonfiction is because at that time in 2020, nurses were afraid to they were going to lose their jobs if they spoke out about, right. you know, wearing hospital scrubs or, you know, speaking out about the people hiding PPE. I mean, you, you'll you wait when you I'm sure when you read that book, you're going to want to talk to us again. But but I that's, knew that that's the plan. <laughs> I, I knew that, you know, this needed to be memorialized again because we're four years down the line and nobody remembers. Nobody remembers, you know, when. When you know at seven o'clock every night, Manhattan was full of banging pots and pans for yeah you know, that part I remember. <laughs> but other people don't, and yeah. other people don't remember. You know, nurses going into fishing stores and buying fly fishing suits to wear as PPE because the hospitals were just out of them. You know, I have colleagues that, that actually did that. They went into a fly a fishing store and they got gloves and they got goggles and they got all kinds of gear that you would wear if you went fit deep where you walk into the water waist deep they were wearing those things mm. they were wearing they were wearing ponchos you know the pizza they, store <laughs> the pizza store on the back because they donated ponchos as yeah. ppe i mean that was crazy it's unbelievable so so yeah that you and know, talk I, about not and being separated from your families oh my goodness people weren't allowed to visit they weren't allowed they wouldn't even let them in the hospital forget about into the room that was crazy. Yeah, I mean, I listen, I know that it's sort of twisted, mm -hmm. but I do remember when all that was happening, <clears throat> I remember thinking all those people who passed away from HIV AIDS back when, you know, they were the pariahs and nobody wanted to come near them. I wonder if, if there is some sort of spiritual, you know, connection that unifies everything. I wonder if they're if if on some level there's an awareness of that and just saying, you know, like this is what it was like. This is what it was like, you know. I, I I I found some weird poetic justice in it, you know. Well, we saw the we certainly saw the uh, similarities, uh, but but also 
not that I, uh, well, I'm just going to say it. I, I was sort of predicting something like that because the way that people get treated, poor disenfranchised people get treated, um, everybody who is sort of in, uh, entitled or has money or has advantages or privileges, however you want to say it, I'll just say the rich and the poor, um, they think that they're, the rich people think that they're not breathing the same air or living on the same earth. But in fact, um, if, if you look back at history, the uh, 1992 multi-drug resistant TB epidemic is a perfect example of how anybody could be affected by an untreatable and lethal disease because doctors, nurses, um, uh, bankers, er everybody, anybody who got MDRTB died. They all died. It was an, an incredible, difficult uh, disease to treat because we had run through the antibiotics. And I, I, I'm not going to explain why, but if you actually look at the book, you, it, the book explains why it happens um, in terms of ba bacterial uh, evolution. But um, But the fact is, is that Rich people think that we don't share the same earth, and so that because they uh, they think that they're above it, they think they're not going to get sick, and all sorts of wealthy people died from COVID because we breathe the same air, we walk in the same streets, we sometimes go to the same stores or eat in the same restaurants. And it was only a matter of time before this was going to happen. And while I don't want to be a doomsayer, it's going to happen again. The, you know, mm -hmm. pe people think that it's okay to treat others like dirt and not give them health care and not treat them like human beings. And so it, the disease might start in a disenfranchised community, but it's going to spread everywhere. Mm -hmm. So... Hold on to your hats. You know, when you talk <laughs> when you talk about, you know, global warming and deforestation and, you know, you have an ecosystem living happily where they live. And now all of a sudden we are removing forests and and, you know, glaciers are melting and you, there will be another novel virus. There will be a virus that is only contained in the population in which it's contained. God. And then it is going to jump to humans as humans become closer to other animals look what happened with with coronavirus so it will happen again okay yeah i'm i, I amen and and i remember I, I did a podcast episode during the or a few during the pandemic but i remember thinking i remember saying this is this feels like it's one of great life's great equalizers and i had some pushback on that where people were like but it isn't it isn't an equalizer because the people who have money are more removed. And my whole argument was, okay, they may feel that more removed, but they're not really because fear is common. And, you know, vigilance is common. Hypervigilance is something we all have to participate in. Um, and and at the end of the day, I, it's just a question of time. Do you know what I mean? Before like the people who feel like it's not going to get to them are affected by it. Well, if the people who think they're unaffected by it still want somebody else to do their laundry and housekeeping, and they still want somebody to deliver the food, maybe cook the food, maybe grow the food, then I'm sorry, but at some point our lives are going to intersect. Well and so said. that's how these things happen. Well yeah. said. Um, I want to bring it back to the the topic of PrEP, this pre-exposure prophylaxis, this, this basically it's HIV medication that people take preemptively in order to avoid infection. Um, yes, I, I worked find... on all those studies. <laughs> Say again? That I worked on all those studies. That's okay. what I did for the last 25 really? years was work on HIV therapeutics and PrEP. So talk to, I me, was about, a, talk to me about uh, beliefs about research. this and, and, and how you feel about it, because it seems like it's such a multidimensional topic. It's such a hot topic. Well, there, I think you have to decide whether you want there to be an end to AIDS. All right. So I think at some point, those in the scientific community decided there has to be an end to this disease. Now, that's not the way that you're going to end a disease that's by and large sexually transmitted is you're never going to change people's habits about sex. We tried and tried and tried and tried and tried. 
and um we were as persuasive as we could be we were gave all the tools gave all the talks did all the education but the sex drive is so primal it is just hugely insurmountable and so you had to address it in the other way there was no way to change people's sexual behavior i'm really truly convinced of this all right and all i have done is hiv for the past 30 years so please believe me when i know this and i i know a lot about sexuality human sexuality so i think that to try to think that people would change their behavior is ludicrous so you have to fight the virus where it is and where it is is in the human beings right so maybe what you need to do is try to put up some barriers so that they don't get the disease. And that's what PrEP is about. Now, when PrEP came out, it became such a social uh, topic of social conversation that, and people were horrified because I forget the guy, there was a guy, I never remember anybody's name, but there was a guy who was very prominent in social media and he was so happy to throw away the condoms. And he would, he was really very, um, uh, very adamant that he wasn't going to do safer sex and that maybe he had been before, but he wasn't going to do it anymore. And we know that that's true. And you know how we know that's true because of the rates of syphilis. So if you want to look at are people using condoms or not using condoms, are they doing safer sex or are they having sex at all? You can just tell because syphilis is, is your marker. It's your, it's your rear view window to see what's happened in the last few months. So, um, so I have to say, better that I treat syphilis five times a week than I see somebody with a new case of HIV infection. And so I'm very, very pro-PrEP. And people say, oh, you know, you're just giving people license to do what they want. Well, I got news for you, bud. They're going to do what they want anyway. So get over exactly. yourself. Just get over yourself. People who want to make it about religion or about mores, I just want to say, I know who you're Zooming also. So please don't tell me that you're without blame in this. So if you would like to um, be the person without sin, you may cast the first stone if you like. But the fact is that people are going to have sex. Amen. So just Amen get- to all of that. Amen. <laughs> you know, I just want to add, you know, but I when, when we... When our our HIV unit closed, I mean, I went back to critical care and Val stayed in HIV research. So I was kind of out of the loop for a while, for a long while. Um, But one of the times, I don't know, several years ago, right after the book came out, we were interviewed by a young man who was also doing podcasts. And I don't, you might remember him, Val, but he came over to my home and we had lunch and he was recording us and he was going to do this. Well, (laughs) and... um, And he would not get himself tested, albeit he was very sexually active and promiscuous. And so much so that when we dropped him off at the train, um, he went on Grindr and had a hookup on the train, which he told us. I mean, he told us his sexual habits sitting at my dining room table. Do, Do you remember, Val? Yeah, but you know, the fact of the matter is that was like story number 537 that I'd heard that week alone. Well, for you, but like, uh, here I am, you know, we're down, we're down the line. We have prep, we have all kinds of stuff. And this guy is not, not getting tested, not interested in any antiretrovirals or prep and thinking that he's going to go unscathed. And then, and then on his phone, looking at Grindr as he sits with us talking about how to prevent AIDS. And anyway, so like, I just, I was like, there was sort of an intellectual disconnect there. <laughs> I try, I think I tried to explain you, it to him. You did. But... You were trying to even get him a doctor, you know, to, yeah. to get him involved with, because, you know, like, like Val said, you know, we weren't going to change his habits. He was there to interview us and we were turning out, we were trying to counsel him saying, what are you doing? <laughs> what do you mean? You know, like, how, I know. but so yes, Valerie is is totally correct, and and she's done more sexual education than I have, you know. But there there it was right in front of me. Like you know what the risks are, you know what you can do to prevent it, yet you will not do it. Yeah, and, there's, a, um, there's a deep yeah. psychological connection there. 
I was going to say the heart wants what the heart wants, but the <laughs> orgasm wants what the orgasm wants is the real <laughs> end of that story. <laughs> Okay, well, listen, Ellen Metzer, Valerie Hughes, I, this has been an honor, truly an honor. Um, and, I, you know, without wanting to sound too dramatic, but I do get the streak from my mother, on behalf of all the people who potentially never had the opportunity to say thank you, thank you. Thank you for thank you. having provided thank you very much <laughs> people with the relief that they needed in the moments when they needed it. Um, you can, for you, the listeners and the viewers, uh, Nurses on the Inside is the book. I'm holding it up right here. It is incredible. I mean, I literally, I devoured it in like a day. And I was, at the end, I was texting Ellen. I was just saying, I can't believe, I need to save the 15 pages for when I'm going to sleep. I don't want to finish it yet. Um, <laughs> That's nurses, nice. Thank you. Instagram handle for Valerie and, and Ellen. And it would be irresponsible of me to not talk about Beyond the Mask the uh, the fiction retelling of uh, the psychological chronicle of six healthcare workers trying to navigate the healthcare system, the onset of the COVID crisis in New York City. Valerie, Ellen, thank you so much. I look forward to speaking to you again. Thank you so much for doing this. It really oh. it means a lot to me, and I hope that there is a lot that is um, transmitted through this Good. to the people who are going to be watching this and listening to this. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. It's our mm -hmm. pleasure. Have a wonderful okay, day. Bye. Take care. Bye.